Welcome to Symposium. And I want to introduce you before we start to Lee Matthew Goldberg, who is a great guy. You guys are going to love him. No pressure, Lee. Um, <laughs> he's the author and screenwriter of 13 novels, including The Ancestor, Slow Down, The Mentor, from St. Martin's Press, um, Stalker Stalked, Orange City, the five book Desire Card series, and the young adult trilogy Runaway Train, Grenade Bouquets, and Vanish Me, currently with actress Regan Rayard. Is that how you pronounce her name? Reverend? Yeah. Yeah. Um, from TV's Young Sheldon attached to the belt. The Great Gimmelum, Gim Gimmelmans is forthcoming in November 2023. Um, he's been published in multiple languages and nominated for the Prix de Polar. After graduating with an MFA from the New School, his writing has always has also appeared as a contributor in Crime Reads, Pipeline Artist. Gee, what a fabulous site that is. <laughs> I agree. Lit Hub, The Los Angeles Review of Books, The Millions, Volume One, Brooklyn, Lit Reactor, Mystery Tribune, The Big Idea, Monkey Bicycle, Fiction Writers Review, um, Necessary Fiction, Hypertext, in a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> pilot, I'll put the whole bio in the on the site. His pilots and screenplays have been finalists in Script Pipeline, Book Pipeline, Stage 32, We Screenplay, The New York Screenplay, Screencraft, and The Hollywood Screenplay Contest. Lee is the co-curator of the Gorilla Lit Reading Series. So one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with Lee um, in front of all of you guys and not just call him up and have a conversation. <laughs> Is, Always do. Yeah, well, we're, you know, yeah, we could do that too. But um, I always love writers that cross mediums and cast a lot of nets. And I just feel like as a writer today, it's kind of what you have to do to survive. So I, we're always trying to encourage novelists to write screenplays and screenwriters to write novels, short stories, all that kind of stuff. And filmmakers do short films, all of that. So we are going to sit with Lee for the next hour and chat about all of that. And Lee was, of course, the first person who came to mind because he does do that. Thank you oh, so much. I think, Lee, I think you have some news. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I just was nominated this week for an Anthony Award, which is a Thriller Award. Um, so I'm really Very excited good. about that. And we'll see what happens um, at BoucherCon. That's very exciting. Very exciting. So Lee, um, also too, Lee did an episode of this podcast needs a title with Erica mm -hmm. and Peter. Um, so you can find that on the symposium site too. And I'll um, link to that. So you guys can listen to that later in when we send you the recording. Um, so Lee, like, can we first talk about, since you have done so well, screenwriting and novel writing, um, I'm not sure I want to know which one you like better, but <laughs> I mean, novel, novel writing's my heart. Like that's where I I started as a novelist. Um, you know, oh hey dog. Um, I, I love screenwriting, and it was, actually was an article of mine I think in Pipeline Artist where I'll use each one as like a palate cleanser between the two. So like I literally I just finished an, like a very intense novel last week that I've been working on for a long time, I'm moving to a screenplay next. Like I would never go novel, novel. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I enjoy both and I like both to complement one another. Um, but novel writing will always have my heart. Yeah. Do you have a hard time bouncing back and forth to each? Like, do you have, does it take you like a few days to kind of get the Yeah. Down? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm going, I'm so my first novel slow down I'm adapting as a as a film and we have some people attached mm -hmm. um so I'm going back to do a rewrite of it so it's characters that I've like known for 15 years I've written a couple of script versions so that'll be an easy transition to go back to I think it's always hardest for me to go back from screenplay then to a novel again mm -hmm. because especially like I just finished a book that's 400 pages like a screenplay is just not so the amount that goes into that, um, it, it's just so much more taxing. And I know it's going to take me so much of a longer time to do it. So that's always a little bit uh, difficult, but I'm always really excited to go back and forth from one to the other. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I started off wanting to write the great American novel and then got pulled into screenwriting, 
for a decade. And now I'm back to pursuing my original dream of writing a novel. And I have to say, if anybody out there is a screenwriter and hasn't tried writing a novel yet, you really should try because it's so liberating. Like yeah. you can put like so much more on the page than you can in a script. So when you, your love is novel writing and then you go to the screenwriting, are you always having to check yourself going, wait, 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 I can't get in their head. Like I can't. Yeah, I, it yeah. used to be harder for me. I think like earlier scripts that I wrote when I first was kind of trying the medium, mm -hmm. um, I, I there was like way too much description. Like my action would be like so much <laughs> description that just wasn't necessary. And I took a really good screenwriting class. I remember at NYU and mm -hmm. um, the teacher there, um, he really helped me kind of like trim it down and get to the basics. And what really helped me the most, honestly, was like reading movies I loved and just reading the scripts and reading the pilots yeah. of them and then kind of just like mimicking what those writers did. And a lot of times the scripts I'm working on, I, I think I have like one original one, but for the most part, I'm adapting my books into scripts. So okay. it's kind of already there and I'm just whittling it down to get those perfect like, 99 pages or you know a pilot so when you so you always write the book first then the script one or time yeah my actually this um it this was my novel pray no more but it first was a script um and it's being published by screenplay press um which is kind of exciting um but that one i wrote first as a screenplay and then I had no intention of turning it into a novel, but I was like, well, the outline's already pretty much there. So yeah. I might as well give it a try. Um, and it was a very lean novel. So it worked really well going from screenplay to, um, to, to, to prose. Yeah, it's, I mean, the screenplay can be like, and that's the other thing like with, you know, NaNoWriMo and stuff, like a lot mm -hmm. of times, like Matt and I would tweet out like take your script and use it as an outline to write a novel I mean, you know because it's it is just a lean yeah you can it up you can add more subplots you can do all this kind of fun stuff you know I had never um, intend oh I'm sorry no no go ahead I had never intended to really like adapt my own work um and then one of my books was optioned and there were all these really good people attached for a second and somebody wrote a script and the script was absolutely the worst thing I had ever read and it killed the entire project and then the producer fell out and the director fell out and about a year later the director contacted me and he was like you know what I feel really bad this is why the whole project fell apart it really was because the script was just not there and I was like oh if you just let me give it you know like let me try, yeah. let me write it. So from then on, I was like, that was a good learning lesson. I'm just going to adapt all my things. And then if it dies, at least I tried everything that I could. It wasn't somebody else that killed my project. And then you can also get a screenwriting credit. That would be amazing. And you you also choose like, because then, because if when you start with a novel and then you go to the script, you have to choose what you're going to take out. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. So there's, you're choosing which subplots get removed and which, so the beautiful part about that is that when the producer or studio reads that your adaptation of your book, they know you're already happy getting rid of those things. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was sort of, and any, honestly, right now, any project that I have that's like, kind of going somewhere it's off of a script that I wrote a lot of times they'll option a novel and then it kind of just sits there because yeah. they have to get the writer they you know they have to build everything around it on the flip side though sometimes they don't want the novelist and yeah. you're you're kind of a thorn in their side if you're like hey I wrote a script um so there's pluses and minuses but I'm I, I feel more comfortable if I have a script and I at least give them the option mm -hmm. if they want to choose to um include that and pay me some money. I used to go down to the New York uh, Rights Fair um, every mm -hmm. year. I remember one time I was there, um, there were some producers on the panel talking and they're all talking about, you know, book rights, film rights, all that stuff. And one of them was saying that they actually like it when the novelist uh, has the first mm -hmm. draft of the script because mm -hmm. then they know the novelist is okay with these changes. But, yeah. but also it's, from a practical standpoint, 
doesn't mean that they're going to not going to add things back in or change it, whatever. But just from a practical standpoint, they have a first draft. So that mm -hmm. saved them a ton of money in development and time. So now they already have a first draft that they know the novelist is okay with. Mm -hmm. And then they hire another screenwriter to come in and like, because they just assume a novelist doesn't know how to write a script. Like, <laughs> sure. No, I honestly, that makes the most sense. And yeah. I, I wish more producers actually thought that way. Now, mm -hmm. now not every you know, novelist is able to write a screenplay, yeah. but also I think in terms of what we're talking about, like a lot haven't even tried, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I think it's a worthwhile effort on both sides to go out of your comfort zone and try something you've never tried before. And, you know, a lot of times it's very hard to get scripts produced and, and to be made. It's not saying that novels aren't hard to get published, but there are more outlets, I think, to get mm -hmm. that where people are going to look at it and read it. Um, versus a whole film or TV series having to be made for your idea to kind of be on a screen. Um, yeah. so I say go for it. You know, like what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, I know. So we've got some questions in here. Yeah, sure. You and I could talk forever, but I just want to make sure we get yeah, to these. Absolutely. So Carl was asking, um, how do you make sure you retain the film rights to the novels you write? Is that a common aspect of a publishing contract? Sure, that's a really good question. So it very much helps to have an agent that's looking out for your contract. If it's your lit agent, so like I had a, an instance with a project of mine where the publisher wanted to keep the rights of um, one of my novels, and luckily it 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 was a short contract, so the contract wound up expiring. Um, I say never give your rights over to a publisher. And even huge publishers really shouldn't ask for it. Like they'll make enough money if it becomes a huge success off of, you know, bestseller, mm -hmm. and just anything coming in. So if you can, whether you have an agent or not, really try to hold on to your, your film and ancillary rights in general. Like foreign rights and all of that. Yeah, I, it, you know, it, it, it's not always that easy, especially for emerging writers. You get mm -hmm. your first deal and you just want that deal. Um, but especially film, like they shouldn't take your film rights, really. Yeah. What's like the, speaking of contracts with publishers, what's yeah. like the, the number one thing writers should watch out for? Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's a, there's a site Absolute Right. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, Absolute Right with a W. Yeah. Um, that will flag any bad publishers, bad agents, so, mm -hmm. I, you know, that that's really the, if, if you have a, a decent and or a good agent and it's a publisher that's known, you're pretty much going to be OK. They're not there to like, you know, like shiv you or anything. Um, <laughs> but I had an instance, one publisher in my career um, never paid me for my royalties. And it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. And, and we wound up this is the one who also took the film rights. Um, we wound up, keep your money, give me the rights back. We'll never speak again. Um, so it was, you know, it was a learning curve with, with something like that. And other people love that publisher. So going into it, I had heard good things, but you never know. So I think always do your research and, and make sure that like whoever you're signing with is legit because there are bad actors, meaning like bad publishers out there. Yeah. There's another site, um, I can't, gosh, you know, it's, it's escaping me. I'll find it. There's like another site that yeah. does all these like warnings like that you can report things to like bad behavior in the publishing industry mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And then they keep track of it and they investigate it. And it's a woman. Yeah. Honestly, it. like go I'm on Twitter people. and just yeah. plug in the publisher. If anything really bad has happened, somebody will say something. Yeah, a hundred percent. They exactly. it, yeah. Twitter is on it. <laughs> they're on it. Yeah. I mean, they're horrible for a lot of things, but like really for that, <laughs> like they'll it'll it'll check out. I mean, and sometimes somebody could say something and it was just a bad fit. So, you know, yeah. you want to do that extra research. But yeah. I think it's always smart to do research about who you're signing a contract with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and think about it like journalism, like you have to get at least a couple sources. Like, right. you know, if one person had a bad experience, maybe it was the person, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, a new ask, um, is it easier to write a script before the novel or the other way around, which we kind of talked about, but um, mm -hmm. how do you start that process? And do you just have characters chatting away to you? 
Yeah, often. Um, yeah, like I said, <laughs> I, I just finished a book that I've been working on for about six months, you know, like these characters I've lived with. For, and it took place in the 30s. So I was like transported back into the 1930s living with these characters. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's whatever you kind of feel most comfortable with. If you think of a script, kind of like I said before, as a blueprint or an outline, a lot of times authors, novelists, we write like long outlines that really detail. A script is kind of that. So your script could be your outline. And then if nothing ever happens with your script, at least it led you to write the novel. Um, but like I said, I've also done it in reverse. I think it's just find whatever your groove is and whatever you're most comfortable with and, and kind of feel it out to see which works best. Yeah. Um, do you have an agent or manager for both modalities? Um, one for each. So I have a lit agent and I have a film agent at my literary agency. Um, and I am currently searching for a manager, but the difficulty a little bit for myself is I'm not so interested in being staffed on a writer's room. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in selling my TV series. And yeah. so I'm waiting for sort of the right time. I, you know, I, I have something that I'm trying to develop. I think it's smarter for me to get that developed and then get the manager from that. Yeah, it's always. And when he said, when Lee says manager, he means screenwriting manager. Screenwriting manager. Yeah. Um, I'm it's like two different. Manager. Yeah, it's like two different worlds um, mm -hmm. for the reps. And then um, they all, Tia also asked, um, is screenplay press specific to the type of conversion you did, screenplay from book or vice versa? Yeah, so Screenplay Press, it's an awesome new publisher that was just started. Um, and it really gives um, screenwriters opportunities for their, their works to be read. Like I said, a lot of times you write screenplays even if it gets on track to pot potentially be a movie, there's so many things that could derail it. And then your script never finds, you know, like uh, a place for people to actually read it and see it. So this could be, in, this is in bookstores, it's on Amazon, and I'm actually doing two events for it. One in LA at the Skylight Books on July 8th, and then one um, in Williamsburg, I'm forgetting the name of the bookstore, but I could remember <laughs> the end of it. Um, and there'll be actors that'll read parts of the, the screenplays. So yeah, look for them, Screenplay Press, um, if, if you're looking to um, send your script. Um, so can we talk about book tours for a second? Sure, yeah, anything. You know, I, I back in the day, um, publishing houses used to put some marketing money behind yep. you and yeah. send you off on tour and pay for your hotel yes. and flights and all that stuff. Let's just talk about the realities today. Yeah. Um, so the reality is if you are a huge A-list, like a Stephen King author, yes, they're fronting your bills for everything, but that's a very small amount of people. For most authors that are B-list, C-list, whatever they would be called, um, they really don't even help set up your book tour. So it's kind of like you do everything and they're like, oh, that's fantastic. And the publisher will support it, but there's no way they're paying for it. So I find like stick to places where you could potentially have a couch to crash. That will save you hotel money. Um, and make sure you do it in places where you know you could bring in an audience because it's so much harder these days for a bookstore even to be open to having an event. So they'll want to make sure you could bring in people. What also really helps is I, like, I'm about to do a tour in the fall that I'm starting to set up now and into the winter. I'll try to book it with other authors. So I'm always doing an event with somebody. It also just makes it more fun. Like nobody wants to just hear you like get up there and talk like it, something like this where there's a conversation. Yeah. It's so much more fun for everybody. And then they have the, the other author has the potential to bring some people. So there's never that dreaded thing when there's like two people. Yeah. Well, there's, and also I've got a friend who um, self-publishes mm -hmm. and a few years ago when she, she had first kind of started off, I don't know what time is flying. It was probably 10 years ago. Who right, knows? Right. And um, they did something that I thought was genius. They, about seven self-published authors got together mm -hmm. and I, I'm going to forget exactly how they did it, but I think they took like the same character, but they wrote, they each wrote a story for it in a different genre. Oh, that's cool. And I, then they sold yeah. it as a 
as a box set. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they had all seven authors promoting this box set mm -hmm. and they all mm -hmm. became USA Today bestsellers. Wow. Because, okay. Yes. Nice. I was like, that is genius. And I wow. feel like if you're gonna self-publish, you've got to be and you, you know, you got to be thinking about all yeah. these different ways to creatively market. Yeah, if you're a good marketer, that will help you with self-publishing because without that, it's like a little bit shouting into an echo chamber. So you have to do something. I mean, honestly, publishing a book these days is shouting into an echo chamber and mm -hmm. very hard. Like I'm working with a big PR company for my next book. It's the most I'm ever going to spend for PR. And yeah. I'm using it as a test to see like what they potentially can get me. Um, but it's kind of like you have to pay to play a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, uh, and this leads perfectly into Lauren's mm -hmm. question about, um, what are your thoughts on self-publishing? So I, I think self-publishing, um, it, for certain genres, I think it's better than others. I think it's, it's quite good, especially for like sci-fi, some young adult, um, romance. I think it's good for erotica. Um, and again, if you're good at marketing, do it. You know, if you've tried the route where you've tried to get an agent, you've tried to send it to some indie publishers and it hasn't worked, and this is something you've put blood, sweat, and tears in, and you really just want it out there, put it out there. Like, I would always suggest, though, to have it professionally edited before you publish it. So there's a ton of freelance editors out there. I work with an editor on all of my books before I even give it to my agent, before he sends it out on submission. So there's always a pair of eyes that are like crossing every T and dining every I. So if you're going to go the self-publishing route, money into freelance editing and put money into PR. Otherwise, it's it's going to be very difficult for somebody to notice it. And also the book cover. Yes. Yeah. And a good book cover designer. And you want to think of a book cover these days that not only will look good on a shelf, but will look good in an Amazon little thumbnail. Mm. So if it's like too busy and then you shrink it down, yeah. it's going to look terrible. Busy isn't busy is for that busy isn't good. If it's like a huge book that Knopf is publishing and they're, you know, like, all right, yeah. but for, for a self-publishing book, like make it simple, make it pop and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of like great graphic artists out there. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it shouldn't cost you too much money for that. No, no. And I mean, even like I published just a few of my short stories and I threw up them, threw them up on Amazon. And like I designed the book covers through Canva. Mm. They came out. Canva, Canva's wonderful. Yeah, like they look professional and, you know, and like great. Had people think those are my actual books. Yeah, that's so, um. So this is like a technical little screenwriting question. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody asked if you use camera direction when you write those scene headings and action sequences. So I don't. I mean, I think, you know, there's an argument both ways, but um, in my understanding, that's like a shooting script when mm -hmm. it gets to that level. And you don't want to get in the way of somebody reading it. It's a little bit like, it, it kind of feels like labor when there's so many camera shots and angles that you kind of lose the flow of the story um and i've had my stuff sent out to like huge managers and producers and nobody has ever been like oh you should have um put camera stuff so i think save it for a shooting script unless you're the actual director as well and this is a project you're doing both for then i would throw them in yeah i mean if you're gonna do it excuse me an indie film you know but yeah, yeah, then do it there's always that line that you don't want to cross and step over like step into the director's role because then if a director mm -hmm. is reading your script they're gonna be like i don't want to cut yeah. there what do you need me for yeah you don't tell me what to do <laughs> yeah yeah so i i would avoid i would avoid it you know the other thing is like we i personally don't use it but some people really like it i i, I don't know what your, your thoughts would be mm -hmm. on that but um yeah. I, I avoid it yeah i think it's a sometimes a style thing but mm. I'm not I don't do it but um so uh Paula asks that you mentioned sometimes they don't want the novelist to write the okay. script and and to work with a novelist I think we can all blame E.L. James for that <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah she, she was like a thorn in their side she was a, she was a nightmare apparently really <laughs> yeah she was a lot but little diva sorry if you're listening E.L. <laughs> um She's 50 but, Shades of Gray, right? That's 50 her? Shades yeah. of Gray, yeah. And um, But she also 
you know, kind of busted open the door for authors in some ways to, mm. to be involved, you know, and um, so there's a little pros and cons to that. But, um, you know, what have you heard about, you know, the reasons why they might not want to work with the author? Um, I think very simply, it's like you'll get in their way. And they have this misconception that novelists can't write screenplays. Mm -hmm. But then you look at a lot of shows right now, like I just watched Fleischman in Trouble, that the creator was the author. So it's happening a lot more than it used to be. The Leftovers was Tom Perota. You know, a, a lot of these amazing shows were created by the authors themselves. And if you think, like, who knows the story better than the author? Mm -hmm. Like, for them not to even give you like a consultant or something like that, it, it's really just foolish because like going back to the story I told where somebody wrote a horrible script, like if they would have just had a meeting with me about it, we could have solved some of the issues that were in that script. But yeah. I was, yeah, I, I was just like left out completely. Yeah. And some places, some production companies and studios do involve, have the screenwriter talk to the novelist and mm -hmm. have that whole meetings. And then at some point the novelist has to step back and the screenwriter yeah. has to just focus and do their job and get it written. You know, like, um, like I adapted a book that while I was working on it, won the Pulitzer Prize and I was working mm -hmm. with the author and, but it's, you know, there's, I viewed it as I'm a very collaborative person and I viewed it as this mm -hmm. person knows this story better than anyone. So why wouldn't I want yeah. to get his input? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, so it's, I think it's different and every author is different. A lot of authors are, and writer, screenwriters as well. I mean, we're all, these are our babies that we're creating and it's very easy to, to not, oh, you can't change that. You can't, can't take that character, <laughs> you know? It's really easy for that and understandable. And so I think it's, you know, they probably gauge a little bit and take yeah. it case by case, you know. Of I what think also the bigger the project gets, the less the author gets involved in it, mm -hmm. which just kind of makes sense. You know, like a little indie movie, I think they're more welcome to it. A $300 million film, it, it, it's like option it and move on from the author kind of. Yeah, yeah. And you just hope they sell a lot of books. <laughs> Actually, I mean, the right. author gains a lot from it too. You know, I, I think you just have to go into every project that it's a completely different experience, almost with different people. And I'm finding with my like entrance into like Hollywood, the people I want to work with are the people I actually want to like spend time with that I'm finding I actually have a trust with them because a lot of Hollywood, I think, is people telling you what you want to hear um and then kind of ghosting you like that was my experience yeah. for a bunch of years so I'm finding that that I, I really don't want to work with people I'm actually like gelling and vibing with and yeah. I could trust yeah yeah and especially since like that whole process takes years so years well, years yeah years it, everything takes years yeah like I'm two years into the tv pilot that I'm working on with the actress from Young Sheldon and like mm -hmm. we're just at the starting gate of sending it out like it, it yeah. everything just takes so long and then the yeah. writers like happened like just as we kind of started yeah of course of so, course yeah. of course it did um so the, since you're talking about tv series I want to touch on mm -hmm. Courtney's question um she said that she's writing a tv series because she's always wanted this story for the screen but often debate debates about whether she should write a novel first for mm -hmm. all the reasons that you've talked about and mm -hmm. um and it might be easier, it's just easier to get the story out there. So would you suggest that she do both, like write the novel and the pilot? Like at the same time? I mean, probably just yeah. have those two pieces of content. Yeah, I mean, go for it. Look, with the pilot, you really only have to have like 50 to 60 pages. You, mm -hmm. you just write the first episode and then like an overview of like the season, if you have ideas for a Bible for season two and season three, sure. But it's it to it, me, it's a lower cost commitment, those 60 pages. Maybe mm -hmm. write that first, see what you have, and then start to build the novel from that, especially if it's your first novel. I don't know, but if it's your first novel and you're still kind of figuring out the mechanics of writing a novel, it might be smarter to start with a pilot. Because I think of everything, pilot, screenplay, and novel, the pilot, just time-wise, because of the page length, 
I think is the least amount of time that you're the, the effort that you're putting into. Of course, if it becomes a series and then you know you're creating the whole thing, it's probably the most amount of time. But that just initial pilot episode, um, I, I think, you know, see if the idea is working for you and then if it could be expanded. Yeah, I mean the pilot, the pilot, I think is pilot scripts, I think are are the hardest scripts because you're you're building, you've got to get the world in yeah. mm-hmm. and and kind of introduce these characters plus tell a story that could mm-hmm. end in an hour or right. however many minutes, mm-hmm. you know, if you include commercials. Um, it's it's a big bite doing the pilot. Also, okay, so I've got to also ask you a question. Yeah. Um, making that choice when you come up with a story idea, am I mm-hmm. gonna does this lean into um, a novel or does it lean into a feature film or does it lead into a TV series or does it lean into a limited series? Like mm-hmm. where do you start thinking or do you think maybe it could be all of those things? Yeah, so like the, the book I just finished, um, I think it could be a, a, a feature length. I think it could be a TV series. I think it could be a, a mini series. So I don't know with that one yet. Mm-hmm. I, I actually don't know if I'm ready to adapt it. I might just kind of take a break from that one um but yeah I mean I think like if it if it's a story that just feels long like it almost doesn't have a set end to it then maybe lean into it as a tv series if you feel like it has like a concrete set end then maybe a mini series um I know that I I, I mean you correct me if I'm wrong but I think like a feature length is the hardest thing to sell at this point it always changes but like that's what I was hearing that an actual feature length is like the most difficult um so and I know like this is where we need Matt (laughs) yeah the the thing also is that like it constantly changes so like the feature length is the hardest and then the pilot is the hardest and it goes to this and this right um but like when I was trying to conceive my young adult series, you know, at first I thought of it, the three books would be three separate movies. And then when I started having discussions about it, they were like, no, it's going to be way easier to sell it as a TV series than, than like three separate movies for like Netflix, yeah. or something like that. Um, so that made me think, and obviously we have to add a whole new world to it. So it, it would be like a 10 episode, you know, season each season. Um, but then after we kind of did it, I realized, no, that was absolutely the right choice. Mm -hmm. It's really limiting it if we didn't allow it to be kind of bigger than the books and also to free myself from the book. Like the pilot barely has anything of the book in it, except for the characters, Mm -hmm. everything they do in the book, they're not doing in the pilot because it just didn't work as a show the way it was happening in the book. So that was a, a like a big pill to swallow. And it took me about 10 drafts to like kind of get it before they were like, this is the one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just be open and let it speak to you. Yeah. And and like, I know like with limited series, when I was pitching a limited series adapted from a book to HBO, one of their questions to me was, could this be a hundred episodes? Like, could, could mm-hmm. you expand upon this beyond the limited series mm-hmm. could it be a hundred episodes? So sometimes limited series they like, because it's just a finite period of time. They're only promising the audience one season and it gives them a way to just sort of step away from it if it wasn't really that successful. But if it is successful, then they like Ozark, they like do another season. But oh, really? Ozark was supposed to just be, supposed to just be one. wow. And wow. so it gives them a way to sort of, test it you know yeah. without without you know saying oh we made a bad choice here you know mm-hmm. um but with limited series when you guys are pitching them they typically will always want to know could it be mm-hmm. bigger mm-hmm. you know um so um and i think you kind of answered this question yeah. already with carl about the lit agents that you have um the lit agents that are looking for a screenwriting manager mm-hmm. um and oh what was your experience with Book Pipeline? Book Pipeline was fantastic. I mean, I all the pipeline has been fantastic. I first met everybody at Script Pipeline. My pilot was in 2015. So it was like really my first introduction into like Hollywood and everybody was so welcoming and embracing. And then Book Pipeline was just so fantastic because it was a world like I understood already a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and then like Peter's one of my closest friends now who used to run book pipeline so like amazing friendship has come out of 
of that and um he's doing well yeah and i i'm going to say this and i promise you that this is not in in relation to my working here or anything like that um i ran script magazine for 10 years before i came to pipeline and one of the reasons i came to pipeline is because um they stay in touch with their finalists for yes. years yeah like, yeah when i came on to help um uh chad and matt launch uh pipeline artists and we we were reaching out to people who who were finalists in the contest 10 years ago to write articles for us and they really are a family and that was something that um really appealed to me and they everybody on the team are writers and so they're they really care about other writers and that's not i don't expect a bonus or a raise yeah. but you deserve it's it the truth no it's, it's true like i mean i've known matt now for almost 10 years and i consider him a really good friend of mine as well and um he, again he was like so welcoming when I was nominated and at the time we went it was like you met with producers out there they had it was like a all in one room and we kind of went from producer to producer back then um and I was so nervous and he was very like you know calming and you're gonna be okay <laughs> just like have a normal pitch. you're not allowed to compliment him when he's not here <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, fair, that's, fair, that's fair um but no I mean I've entered a bunch of other competitions and done well at other ones and like mm -hmm. I, I don't really have a relationship with any of the other ones to be honest <laughs> I mean it's true um okay Kevin has a question I really yeah. would love to get to um he wants to discuss like discuss the pace of your novel versus pacing mm -hmm. a screenplay same okay. story like is it like quick scene breaks of a screenplay and heavy on dialogue etc all that like the kind of the pacing of it yeah, I mean, I primarily write thrillers, so I'm pacing is like one of the biggest parts of thrillers anyway. So I'm always like Stephen King said something really great where when he's writing, he always ramps up the action as it gets to the bottom of the page. So you literally want to turn the page. So I kind of always think about that in the back of my head for novel writing, for screenwriting, like always just making sure the action is ramped up as much as possible. Um, for something that's not a thriller, yeah, pacing is important, but it, it's not always my number one priority. You're creating characters a little bit more and description and, and things like that. But yeah, for thrillers, 100%, like it's pacing, tension, pacing, tension. Yeah. I always imagine like when I'm writing a screenplay, imagine somebody standing behind me with a remote control. Like, are they going to turn? Oh, yeah. Are they yeah. going to turn it off? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I do feel like and maybe it's also just because I've written a lot more novels. Like I go through a lot more drafts of screenplays. So mm -hmm. a lot gets edited and edited and edited. Where these days I'm a lot better with novel writing. Like my first vomit draft almost now is like my third draft. Like it's mm -hmm. already at a good point when I finish it. Um, and with screenplays, that's never the case. Like it takes me a lot to get there. I think a lot of that is because you just have to like. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of slicing and dicing. I still need with screenplays like a lot of other eyes kind of looking at it and giving me notes and things like that. And it's it's also so dependent on who it's going to and who's looking at it and their notes. So a lot of times you could feel like you're finished and then like I, I have a project and the actor wants a lot changed. So I'm changing a lot for him in terms of a script um, where I thought it was at more of a done level and it's just not. And I think it'll ultimately make it better. Um, but you just have more people like in the room with ideas with scripts a lot of times because the screenplay is not the whole movie you know there's like a million other people connected to it where you know with the novel yeah you have an editor and then there's the publishing team but it's a lot more like yours and your decisions um which is i think why i ultimately prefer it one over the yeah. other um, so well so that's a perfect segue to alex alexander's question about um you know, getting an agent. So like, yeah. how did you get your agent? Yeah, so I went to an MFA program um, and I had a novel when I graduated. It was like my thesis and I sent it out to like a bunch of agents. I think it still is a site. This was Agent Query. That was how I found a lot of them. I think it, it's, still, it's still a site and there's probably a lot of other really good ones. Mm -hmm. um, and I was rejected by everybody. Like people like, <laughs> to say, but you know, like the same old kind of stuff. Um, and then a friend of mine got a really good deal with an agent and she was like, I think he would be a good fit. 
and I gave him my book and he read it and he was like, I have a lot of notes. I don't want to sign you yet, but if you rewrite it with my notes, let's talk again in six months. And I took every one of his notes. I made the change and I sent it to him and he's been my agent ever since. We never sold that book though. We actually never <laughs> sold the book. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think a lot of it is about like fit. Mm. Uh, I've had one agent for my whole career. A lot of authors have had multiple. So yeah. I'm an anomaly, uh, you know, like I'm the outlier basically in terms of that. Um, you know, you I go, think, yeah, I'm sorry. Jody you know. Picot had, I don't know if she still does, but I remember the last time I had read about it, she had had her same agent for years and it started with this agent when they were just small. Yeah. And and she grew as their agent mm. grew and it's sort of a loyalty sort of family that stick together yeah. thing. You want to make sure that like your voice is heard with them and it's mm -hmm. like a conversation, I, you know, they could be like a huge agent, but if it's their way or the highway, always that would yeah. be really hard for me to work with. It's always a conversation. I have, I have agents that represent my thrillers and in the same company that also represent my YA. So I have two that I work with and it's a nice balance. You know, they're both very different, but I kind of get equal things from each. Yeah. And um, sort of, and Beth was asking about agents and screenwriting agents mm -hmm. and um, it's definitely screenwriters usually start with managers and then the yeah. agent comes in when you're going to make a deal, like, you know, because yeah. they can negotiate that kind of stuff. And, um, but she was asking, um, do you think it's better slash easier to start with a book over a screenplay as it may be easier to get a book sent, a book agent, let agent over getting a film agent. And it seems that so many TV shows and movies today started out as a book first. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're both not easy, you know, <laughs> that's sort of the reality, but I, I do think it's easier to get a, a book agent and a book deal than a film agent and sell the script it, it's it's some small there's way more books that are made than film and tv shows if you think about it mm -hmm. uh, so if you're kind of waffling between the two um you know i would start and you could also start your career without an agent you know like you could send your stuff to indie publishers. I've gotten myself indie deals without my agent, you know, like where my young adult series I sent to um, the publisher. I, I just w heard about it one day and I, I just felt like sending it. Like I'm a little bit like rogue like that sometimes. Like I just do things. Did they care? No, we got a deal and like they handled the contract and I gave them all, you know, like the percentage of it. Yeah, like we're good. Yeah. Um, and it was just a thing where like at that moment, like I didn't think the deal was 100% going to happen. Like I just tried, see what happens. And then they loved it and they wanted three books. And um, so you could do it without an agent to start and then, you know, use that to get the agent as well. So really mm -hmm. looking to a lot of indie publishers, depending on what you what you write and what genres you write, because a lot of them will accept without agents these days. They actually prefer it because... It's a little easier for them. Usually they won't have somebody being like, fix this in the contract, fix that in the contract, fix that in the contract. So, but you should still have somebody look at your contract. <laughs> I would always say, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I was just being funny. Um, yeah, I know, I know. No, no, no. You, you, you should always have somebody look at your contract. If you have a friend who's a lawyer, that is a good person. Even if they're not like a contract lawyer, they'll be able to like look over a contract. I had a friend do that for my first agent contract, a good friend of mine who was a lawyer. Um, and then when you get to a bigger level, um, you should have a lawyer outside of your agent looking at contracts. Mm -hmm. I think the Authors Guild has um, some sort of service where they- They, they do. Through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Authors Guild, I think you, it's like a couple hundred bucks or something like that. I've heard people use that, but if it's if it's like a major major deal, mm -hmm. I would give the because you're only giving the lawyer ten percent of what you'll make. You're not paying them before for it, so mm -hmm. like it, it's really worth it, honestly. And then that's your entertainment yeah. for like all your projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so somebody's asking about dialogue. So when you're taking your book and adapting it into a script, mm -hmm. um, how do you handle that? the dialogue and yeah. then you just lift it right from the script i mean the book do you 
play around with it some more. Yeah, I mean, you you play around with it a lot gets, you know, like you have to kill so many darlings, if you know that expression, like when you're moving from book to film. Um, so a lot goes, nobody wants a speech, you know, like you really kind of learn to like whittle it down to just the necessity more in a script or especially in a pilot even it's like everything that's there 100 percent has to be there we're a book yeah but like there is flexibility where you could mm-hmm. like kind of like languish in a scene for a little bit um where nobody is like nobody has time for that in a in a tv series or film which amazes me because sometimes i'll watch some shows and they're horrible and like the first 30 minutes are like pointless and don't move the plot at all. And I'm like, how did this even get made? Like, I just watched one. I'm not going to name it because that's mean. But I was like, how did this show get made? Like, was this honestly written by AI? Like, Sometimes we say that like all the time we watch stuff for like, you know. Like this one was just horrible and the dialogue was terrible. And it was an Apple TV show, by the way. Oh, Okay. No, I love Apple TV and I love Severance and I love, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, if you want to try to figure out what it was, that was there's a, also a really popular thing. Apple TV show that I don't get at all. I just am like, I don't get it. I don't get why Severance though was one of the best shows. Is that good? Yeah, I haven't checked I, that out. Just an amazing, amazing, interesting, really cool show. And they do a lot of other really good shows too. Like I really liked um, Bad Sisters, which I think was. Um, mm-hmm from the BBC and the one with um, uh, the actress from Neighbors. She plays like the physical fitness person oh, in the 80s. Yeah. I'm terrible with names, so yeah. that would never happen. Ha- I'm physical. never not gonna help you. Yeah, physical. Yeah, so, um, okay, so about what, when you- Rose Byrne, Rose Byrne, I just- Oh, listened. there you go. Thank yeah, you. there you go. Thank yes. You. Rose Byrne, um, yeah. So like, when you're adapting like what would you say like the percentage of the story is the same as the book and the and the script and also the other thing about adaptation is you're thinking about I think I think the hardest part about adaptation is you're competing with the reader's imagination Mm -hmm. and so do you think about like are you just focused on story are you thinking about are my readers loyal readers who've read the book what are they going to think of this adaptation um not really <laughs> yeah that's that's Sorry, not, that that yeah I mean that that was like for the project in particular I was really thinking about like what the people attached want and giving them exactly what they want so it was very sort of specific and mm-hmm. had very intense notes about sort of what they were looking for um so it actually made it easier because it allowed me to kind of just take like move away from the book and not have the book be the bible for everything but I know the characters so well that the characters kind of just came out Mm -hmm. and I like honestly when you know a a movie from a book or a tv series from the book becomes its own thing like if it's literally just the same thing and I've read the book like I don't want to watch the movie like you have to show me something kind of new in it so I think when it creates its own world and it's separate from it yeah it actually works out best I think um and none of my books were like such a huge success that like I have like readers like screaming at me if I make any changes so yeah I don't know maybe if I have yeah yeah that's true yeah yeah maybe with a much bigger one people would come at me with pitchforks I don't know I know. I'm loving that you guys have so many questions, but we probably aren't going to get to all of them. So I'm trying to like to find some ones that were that stuff that we haven't talked about yet. Are um, we allowed to go over or is it? Yeah. Like, uh, okay. It's, it's I'm just fine. Us. Yeah. I'm fine with going over to answer. Yeah. I don't think Zoom will like cut us off or anything. Okay. Like that. Okay. Um, so. Um, so. Oh. Uh, best book you've read on novel writing specifically that you'd recommend so like on the craft yeah I've mentioned him a few times and I obviously am a huge fan but Stephen King's on writing is Mm. probably the best um E.M. Forrester has a great one I think it's like acts of the novel or just look up E.M. Forrester who wrote Howard's End you know a billion years ago um his is a great book um I'm trying to oh um Elmore Leonard has a fantastic one too and it's like, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like the 10 things 
the 10 best things to do and like the 10 worst things to do in novel writing. Mm -hmm. And it's very succinct. You could read it in like an hour. Um, and if you've never read Elmer Leonard, he's, you know, one of the masters. Oh, and I should also point out, because I don't think I said this in his in, in the intro of Lee, he used to teach writing for like 10 years. I did. Yeah, I mostly taught it was like intro level essay and literature. Um, but I taught a couple of, of of writing classes and it's something I might go back to in life. I don't know. We are, we're going to try to get him to do a symposium for us. So oh, done. Stay yeah. tuned. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. So um, Lauren was asking that everybody approaches outlining differently. And what does it look like for you when you're starting mm -hmm. a new new novel? Like, are you a pantser, yeah. plotter? I'm, my first book, Slow Down, was a pantser and it took me many years to write. And then I think once I understood the craft of a novel, I'm 100% a plotter now. So usually an idea, like this last one that I just finished that, that I was talking about that takes place in the 1930s, it's like the dawn of advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and also like anti-Semitism and Nazis. And it, 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 it's, it's a very like historically heavy novel. So I needed it to marinate for almost a year, I think in my head. And then I one week I just sat down to write the outline and I'll usually write like a paragraph per chapter and then start the book and about 60 to 70% into the outline, the wheels start to kind of fall off and I just let it go. So like whatever needs to be changed, changed, but I at least have enough that I'm never sitting before like an empty screen or anything like that, which is yeah. I think a writer's worst nightmare. Um, but you need to play with it yourself. Like so many people don't know if they're pan, you, know, you have to find what works for you. There's authors that could never plot a book. Um, if you've done screenwriting, you're probably more a plotter in all honesty, um, just because you already know that kind of style. Um, pan pantsers tend to be more like literary writers, books where like plot and action aren't the forefront, I, I would say, but it, it's, it's up to you as a writer. Of course, I just muted myself because my dog's coming. Here she comes. Oh, with a treat. She's got her toy. <laughs> nice. It's a beautiful um, one. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that's really great, really. Um, so you, when you talk about writing the first draft and the vomit draft, mm -hmm. so as you're writing, there's those arguments about like, you shouldn't edit at all. You shouldn't touch anything. You should just keep going through the whole thing. And some people start their day by going back and doing some tweaks to the chapter they yeah. wrote before they start like their day. Like, what is your, what is your process? Yeah. Mine is less of a vomit draft, which is, I think what I was talking about before, like it's it all, the first draft for me almost becomes like my third draft. I am 100% writing and then going back and rewriting as I write. So then the beginning becomes like rock solid and I feel like I have enough of a foundation and I'm constantly editing and editing as I'm working on it. Um, some people like to just get it all out there, but it, that gives me like agita because then I feel like it needs so much work still. Like I'd rather go a little slower and kind of ease into it. And then I feel like I know the characters a lot stronger. Um, here is probably something a lot of novelists who are transitioning, you touched on it before, would struggle with. Um, Alex Sanders says, I'm a recovering novelist, <laughs> transitioning to a screenwriter. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and they were asking like tips about whittling down description. Mm -hmm. I actually have, Alexander, if you go and on Script Magazine's website, I wrote an article about, uh, I think if you search polishing a screenplay about how I cut and I have like a examples with, you know, crossed off stuff and it'll give you a little bit of an idea an actual to look at an idea, but weigh in Lee. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's stylistic. You have authors like Edith Wharton that it's like a full page of description about a wall and a hat, yeah. So it, it depends on what you're really aiming for. These days when I'm reading, if there's a lot of description, I'm so bored because you're almost saying to the reader, like, I don't trust you enough to imagine kind of everything as I'm writing it. So I'm just going to do everything for you where, and especially in terms of like, I think physical features and description, a lot of times when you're reading a book, you're, you really just need the bare minimum. And then your version of a character that you read is very different from another 
person's version of it. So I feel like kind of just give the bare essentials. Don't overdo it. And if you ever feel like, should I add this other description? You probably shouldn't. Yeah. And I think um, he was asking about calling down the description for a script. Like, so. so oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, like to move it into action and yeah and like make it because I have to say I miss that Twitter I liked Twitter when it was 140 characters because I thought it was just a great exercise every tweet you had to condense what your thoughts were into a smaller thing and I thought that was such a great way to train screenwriters to write succinctly and I miss that um um but think just think about stuff like that like how do you how do you just call down? I heard, like, I heard how many words do you really need? Yeah, I heard an interview with um, Jake Gyllenhaal once where he was talking about like the ideal dialogue and he was like, the more white on the page, the better kind of, you know, mm-hmm. like the less clunky description because a lot of it's probably going to change once it gets to like production anyway. So, you know, give a bare minimum, give a bare minimum of like, you know, a physical and then, you know, if you're setting something in a different era, I think maybe it requires a little bit more in terms of like, you know, the decor and, uh, you know, the setting and things like that. The most part of, you know, a living room, it's like only say what moves the character forward. So if there's like an item in the living room that really is selling something about the character that you don't need the dialogue for, that's something you should include. If it's like there's a TV and a coffee table, like, of course there is, like, it's a house, you know, you don't need to add that really, like, just add stuff that's really like essential to building the character. That's what I think. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, so Paula asks, as an emerging writer, a number of my short fiction pieces, which I've submitted in competitions, have praised my unexpected use of dialogue to tell the story. Is that a hint? that I should think more in terms of screenwriting over novel. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like I said, just try something different. The worst that happens is you're gonna be like, maybe it's not for me, but maybe it is. Like, I think as writers, the best thing you could do is always just challenge yourself as much as possible. I had never thought I was gonna write a young adult novel, especially in the voice of a 16 year old girl, which is my series. Like, that was not something. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna try it. and. I'm going to make it as authentic as possible and it worked. Um, so I think always just try to like challenge yourself in, in terms of it. If you've always write something and it's not quite working out, like try something different. I love that advice because it's, you know, I feel like when you, you know, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And, completely. You know, and that's, and like, I, you know, when people always say like, write what you know, like, obviously you were not a 16 year old girl. <laughs> No, um, no. <laughs> and like when Wally Lamb wrote She's Come Undone, mm. it was amazing. And, you know, he wasn't a 13 year old girl either. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but, there's certainly things that you're not, you know, acceptable to write. Obviously, correct. you know, like 100%. Like you right. cannot write everything and, and an experience that you fully do not understand. But right. with the 16 year old character, it's like I started with her humor, we had the same sense of humor. And it kind of built from that. And I really leaned on a lot of, um, you know, females who were able to look at drafts and give me mm-hmm. advice. And it took place in the 90s. So a, a lot was, you know, very similar experiences about what we were happening. And you know, it was something I kind of tried. And that's the project that, you know, is the furthest along in development. So yeah. I, I think it's always good. I think just like you said, you know, the uncomfortability, I think, you know, sometimes really equals really amazing things happening. Because it's like pushing you to write about the stuff you're scared to write about. Yeah. And when you can like rip open the wound and just dump mm. the salt in there and just really mm. feel something and put that on the page, it's, and all also when we talk about writing a character, you're not, you didn't live their life, right. you know, but it's finding that, um there's no way we could all write something that is mirrors our life you mm-hmm. know um mm-hmm. so you finding that thing about them that you might have like you said humor like you have in common yeah. with the yeah. some way you can relate to them or or some way you can relate to the theme of what they're mm-hmm. experiencing mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um so oh 
Um, Courtney asked about um, my pitching HBO and and my experience with that and how I got in the room. And um, but that was like a well, I adapted a Pulitzer Prize winning book, so that made it easy to get in the room, you know. Um, and pitching is that's a whole other topic, and I would love to talk about you know that one day about like how you connect in the room with people and it's a lot of it is just kind of like you know just having a regular average joe conversation with them at first and then you then you kind of ease into you know just you know being human and people but um um always courtney also want to know about um which streaming platforms would we suggest um is looking at uh the most now for series and open to great stories for new writers it's hard to like unless you're repped it's really hard to get a meeting with one of the streaming platforms i mean that's yeah that's i mean problem. i've i've found the, the only progress i've had is when other people have gotten attached mm -hmm. and then it's like i piggyback on their reps to get me into mm -hmm. a room that's really how everything has kind of happened i i you know i think as a writer and still a budding screenwriter um so yeah i mean and and that's not easy too but I think like, you know, if, if if you've written a script, if you've entered it into like some contests and it's doing well, so you feel put it on the blacklist, it's gotten good marks on the blacklist, so you feel kind of secure, you know, these days you could reach out to anybody kind of like find them on Instagram, even reach out. Yeah. I reached out to a director. It, it didn't wind up happening, but I like I really liked his movie. I reached out to him. And he looked at a script of mine. It wasn't what he was looking to do, but like that was through Instagram. <laughs> like, yeah, no, yeah. And there's like a there's that fine balance between you know connecting on social media and going a little too far. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't have like it's a comment list that you just send to every. You know, like yeah. this was a movie that I really loved, and it started out me just being like, "Hey, I loved your movie." And then yeah. it devot, he was like, Oh, you're a writer. What do you were, you know, like it, it, right. it, anytime, honestly, anything happens organically, it's the best. I've also found with Hollywood, if a Hollywood is reaching out to you, the project has a better chance of happening than if you are reaching out to them. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. Like anything yeah. good really happens when they want you because otherwise you're like one of a million, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, and just a note, Jamie had dropped some um, titles of the books, but Jamie, you put them with just the host and panelists can see. So if you could click on that yeah, little carrot and yeah. put it for to, so everyone can see it and redrop those names. Oh, you did. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I'm you. A little, yeah. yeah. I appreciate I'm, I'm it. some of the titles. So I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So. Okay, so somebody asked about, okay, I want, um, Tia wanted to know if you could talk about not wanting to be a showrunner or writing in the, the writer's yeah. room. And so, um, yeah. yeah, and that, you know, focusing on the goal of just wanting to, you know, write something and sell it and not necessarily want to. Yeah, I have absolutely no desire to be a showrunner. I don't think I'm the best person for that. I don't love like a billion emails and constant <laughs> people wanting things from me it's why I've chosen to be a writer in life so I'm like left alone <laughs> um, so don't make me a show a showrunner um, but I would love to you know have it be like the show that I create and be a part of the writer's room in, in, in some way shape or form um, you know I think it so depends on who you're connecting with depending on the project, what they're looking for, what they're open to. It fluctuates constantly. I've had friends that move from being the creator to the head writer to a consultant. It, it, it so all depends. Everything is up in the air right now, like strike wise. I mean, like I am not pitching anything. I'm respecting the WGA. Mm -hmm. So I would use the summer as like a time to just write, honestly, and like not sort of worry about the next step. That's kind of what I'm doing. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if, if whatever your dream is, like go for that dream, whatever you feel like you're not 
capable of doing you, it, your gut probably is telling you the right thing like my gut is like do not be a showrunner <laughs> yeah I mean I think it's uh I, I think you should always listen to your gut like for sure but I also think the landscape is changing a lot and but I remember the uh 2007 2008 strike because I was out may have had a trip to LA and I was had pitch meetings that stopped because because <laughs> of that but um, but I remember talking to an agent at that point and them just saying, look, just, you know, and, and another producer saying the same thing, just go home and write, yeah. just write, you know, um, and that, cause you, then you'll have all your material. And, and I think people in this time period during a strike, when they're writing, it's, um, you know, as Matt puts it, the fuck it script, you know, like mm -hmm. they tend to write something that's, that maybe their agent wouldn't want them to write or their manager yeah. would no, no, yeah. no, don't write that one. That's not marketable. But now you're like almost free. Mm -hmm. And so you write that thing that you're really passionate about. And that might be the one, you know? Yeah. And especially if you're not in the Writers Guild and you're not picketing right mm -hmm. now, you know, like it's a good time to just write, watch every, like take the time to like watch shows you've never watched before, see movies you've never seen, you know, really just like soak up as much as possible, which I always think is the best kind of advice for for anybody to, you know, kind of get a sense of what's out there and what people are looking for. And I, I do think after strikes, people buy like hotcakes because there's been such a dearth of stuff that they're all, that's at least what I'm being told. Uh, Everyone here is going to hold you to that. <laughs> I look, I hope so. Look, if it doesn't happen, then my show doesn't happen. So I, I'm hoping that, that that's the case. But I've been told that like, they wait until, you know, and then when it ends, they kind of start buying like, you know, like, which makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so somebody asked in writing my novel to be published June, 2023, congratulations. Oh, congrats. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. I kept the script in mind and wrote ideas on opposing mm -hmm. pages. Um, could you comment on that idea? And, you know, do you, do you, are you, when you're writing one, are you thinking about the other? Yeah. I mean, my writing is very filmic, like I like to say, so it's super visual and all of my work almost reads like movies or reads like a TV show. So I'm constantly always thinking about that. I'm often thinking about like who I might want to play the role in an ideal situation. It also just helps me visualize it in any way. And what was the, the either the first or the second part of the question that I missed? Uh, I think I <laughs> It was like a two-fold question. Yeah. What yeah. Was the first part? Find it. Um, oh, I think they were saying that they were writing, uh, when they were writing the novel, they were also writing, um, they were thinking about the script, so they're writing yeah. notes. Yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's really good. You know, like, in some ways, it's twofold, you don't want to like, over index your brain. So if you're thinking about two separate things, you know, it's like a jack of all trades, like you're not focusing like on the one thing that you should be. So I, I do think it's best, like, write the novel have some ideas in mind, but I wouldn't kind of jump back and forth and jump back and forth. It's, mm. uh, you're going to get a lesser of both almost. It's like finish the novel, then with some of the notes you have, then start writing the, the script of it. And I think that actually answers Jamie's question because she was asking if you write the script and the novel simultaneously. Yeah, I've um, never, no. That, that'd yeah. be really like my, my poor brain. Like I, I wouldn't, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> so but I just also want to ask you a question about your writing process because sure. people are always saying like because a lot of us have full-time jobs and yeah. um and then some I'm just gonna and, turn on my AC so if there's a blowing noise that's that okay. oh I don't hear it okay cool. um so because this conversation is so hot <laughs> yeah. and it's hot I'm in New York City and it's like it's hot <laughs> so like, you know, we all, everybody talks about like, you know, how do you find time to write? I don't have enough time to write. Like, how, you know, you write full time, but mm, yeah. at some point, so there's your process of how you write now as a full-time writer, but you're also your process of writing when you are also a working mm -hmm. for the day job kind of thing. So mm -hmm. if you could just kind of speak a little bit about like, sure. you know, blocking out time and what- Yeah, I mean, doing. you know, life kind of gets in the way of writing all the time jobs you know kids if you have I don't have kids so that's allowed me to write a lot more free than if I did 
it's like whatever time you can make, find the time, carve out that time. If it's from five to six in the morning, then that's your writing time. If it's from 11 p.m. to midnight, then that is just like find whatever time. I don't think you need to be so precious where it's like I can only write when I'm feeling like the spirit in me, you know. If you're time constraint, like just write, like just sit down, don't worry about it. Don't light candles and make such a big deal about it. Like just sit down, get what you need to do, and, 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 like move on. And, I, and I'm being funny, but like, I do think people like, okay, I'm writing and I have to get the whole process and the sun has to hit in the perfect way. And like, just do it basically. That being said, like when I'm absolutely not feeling it, and that tends to happen when I'm like thick in a novel sometimes, like this last one, I wrote 70 pages in a week, which is absolutely insane. And it's wow. just because I was so in it. And then there was one day where I was like, I can't, I don't even want to look at it. I don't want to think about it. And I allowed myself to take that day. So mm -hmm. I think it's like, be kind to yourself and also treat yourself. Like you have a good writing day, like, buy yourself an ice cream, like do nice things to yourself. Like, don't be so like harsh. Oh, I needed to get five pages and I hate myself because I only got four. Like you're human and it, it's creative juices and you can only do so much sometimes. So my advice is to, in a very long winded way of saying like, you know, just be very free with it and, and don't be hard on yourself. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to show you my little trick. There's this thing. It's a clock that has like different times on it, like five minutes, 15 minutes, 30, okay, 40, yeah. 60. And like, depending on where you turn it, like it's, it's starting. Oh, cool. Okay. Right? So it just, it'll then, it's like doing a writing sprint and it forces you to focus. Cause you're like, oh, okay. Like I told it, I was going to do it for 15 minutes. And even 15 minutes mm -hmm. gets the story in your head so that like first thing in the morning, like you do like a little 15 minute thing. I bought that clock on Amazon. I don't know what it's called, but it's I'll, cool. I'll, I get, yeah. I'll put it in when I send the email out with a recording, I'll stick it in there. But um, it's it, even 15 minutes. Like then when you go off on your day, you're thinking about it, you mm -hmm. know? And one of the other things I do to help me get in the world of what I'm writing, I'm writing an historical book right now, is I'll listen to podcasts about that era yeah yeah while i'm taking walking the dog or yeah. going for a run or something you know podcasts i think for the world building or that's really a, that's really good especially for any you know different era like you really want to absorb yourself like i was reading only books taking place in the 30s i was watching mm -hmm. all 30s doc it was like 30s and 30s and 30s and 30s and 30s and i yeah. had like a website that was like 1930s speak so like I was using that in the dialogue as well. And like, it was infiltrating my own life. Um, so yeah, you just want to absorb yourself. Like I write, most of the time I write actually in, in Central Park, I'll go to Central Park and I work outside and then I'll walk home. So it's like a 40 block walk. And I'll think about what I worked on, on that walk. And sometimes that walk is the most helpful because I'll mm. think about what worked, what didn't work what I want to do the next day. Um, so I think it's like, find whatever you're, you know, that could help you kind of, you know, get your brain working in the best way and add that into your day. Yeah, I think moving, I think it's also like, sure. people yeah. talk about like taking a shower to get ideas. Like mm -hmm. I, I have never gotten an idea in the shower. <laughs> I totally have a hundred percent. It's different for everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Listening to music, going to a museum like I'm always just trying to keep inspired as much as possible so if the writing's not there I do something else that is going to enhance my brain and that I don't feel like I wasted a day yeah somebody else that driving helps them yeah I live in New York so that that's not for me but yeah <laughs> I did have a friend who um he used to be the page one editor of Bloomberg and he wrote when he was living in like New Jersey and he was commuting um, by train into the city to work, he had like two hours a day where the hour in and hour mm -hmm. out where he would focus on writing. And that's where he would write like on the train. And then yeah. um, when he moved into the city, he thought, oh, I'm going to have so much more time now. I don't have all this commute, blah, blah. He's like, he didn't get half the writing done. He needed the commute. Yeah. 
because he used the commute time and he was trapped. There's yeah. nothing else he right. can yeah, I think, you know, like we were saying, whatever time in the day you could switch and devote to it, yeah, do it, even if it's 15 minutes, it's 15 minutes more than nothing. And it's just keeping it in your head. Sure. Um, yeah. So someone asks, in your personal experience, are novels more financially lucrative? No. <laughs> that was quick. Novels, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, are not financially lucrative. Well, and I think, I think that's, we want to have a whole other symposium about Just, yeah. the real talk about the money of being an artist. Yeah, it's and, very little money for the work that you're putting into it. Like, look, there are big deals that happen, but even a big deal, okay, like I had a friend worked on a book for two years, got a $100,000 book deal. Okay, so that's 50000 a year. And that's amazing but that's also like if they got a job as well um and that's hard to come by deals could be twenty five thousand. deals could be zero and you're getting royalties um so if you're really going into this to be like i'm going to make a ton of money it that's that shouldn't be the first thing that being said when you get a deal and then other things happen to that deal you get foreign rights you get audio rights a film option. Now, all of a sudden, there's some money attached to it, but it still is not a lot of money. Yeah. You know, like, again, I live in Manhattan. Like, it, 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 it very, very just pays the bills, kind of. Yeah. And, and also, too, like, but when, like, if you get your book optioned, like, say you wrote a novel and you get it optioned, they're paying for, you know, that for a certain time period and that can expire, but you yeah. could easily get, I don't know, easily is the right word, but some people, I have a friend who got $10,000 for an option of, of the, his book. Yeah. It expired, got renewed four times. He got paid $10,000 to option. Sure. So, and, and the book never got made into a movie, but he got- Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, if it gets made into a movie, then it's more money. And so like, that's mm -hmm. you know, like the goal. But sure, you can make like good extra, you know, but it's very hard. Like I'm trying to do this full time for as long as I feel like I can. Um, and I'm reaching a point in the next year or two, like if things don't take off on such a level, I'm going to have to get some other type of job as well. Um, it's just reality book contracts used to be more than they are now. And yeah, they when inflation has gone up, book contracts have gone down. And, but also like, if you're doing the novelist thing, like my friends who are able to do it, it's the backlist. So like, it's about, yeah. you yeah. have to keep going. Yeah, yeah know, absolutely. You know, do it. If, if you're prolific and you have a big backlist and there's good royalties, then you could potentially, you know, always have a little money, always being kind of added to your account at all times, which, which is really the dream. Yeah, it is the dream. Oh, yeah. that, that means... I happen to love my job though so I truly and so like I don't think I want to be a full-time writer I think I like my job and writing on the side and makes me happy there's and a lot of stress being a full-time writer not just financially it's like if I don't work every day and create mm -hmm. I like I you know like that's my What's job so yeah so there's this added element of kind of stress with that that Sometimes it would be nice not to have, but then at the same time, like I, I've wanted to be a writer since I was four years old. It's my absolute dream. And the fact that I get to put books out there, it, it, it's, it's what I've always wanted to do. So I couldn't ask for anything more. Yeah. So on that note, I'm going to ask you one final question. Sure. Well, maybe I'll ask you a second one after okay, this one. Yeah, I, I Paula asks, what keeps you balanced? It's a good question. I'm honestly trying to search for that a little bit better I do feel like I overtax myself especially with this last book that I was working on it was very heavy it was a very dark book about a very dark time mm -hmm. in history and I had never quite like it was a scene I wrote about the holocaust like I had never tackled something like that and I just finished it a few days ago so I'm still kind of mm -hmm. coming off from it so I didn't have a good enough balance with that, like that I'm trying to search for in a better way. 
mm -hmm. think it helps that I work in nature and I work outside. So that kind of keeps me open in that. I don't know. I was doing Reiki a bunch while I was writing this. <laughs> that helps. Why outside though in the winter? Oh no, in the winter I go to the main library on 42nd Street. Okay, just checking. Library. Just, but just pretty much I'm imagining there. you in a coat. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty much there April through November. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's like 47 and above, I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. But okay. yeah, I think you have to find that balance. I'm searching for a better balance. Yeah. I Honestly. think I think we all are. Yeah. Um, okay, final question. If you could go back in time and tell your 18-year-old self a piece of advice, it doesn't have to be about writing. It can be about life. Um, okay. What do you wish you knew that you could go back and tell your 18-year-old self? So I think it would be about writing. And I think it's really the, the thing that writers have to be the most like adaptable and comfortable with. It's that everybody gets rejected you'll be rejected more times than you'll be accepted. And to learn to deal with that rejection and not let it like define you and break you down and all that, because it was very hard for me at the beginning when I was starting out. And it took me about two years to get an agent and then about another two years to sell my first book. So it's about a four year period. Um, and I wish I would have told myself like, it's par for the course and it'll only make you a better writer um and it's something i'm still constantly telling myself because you're always going to be rejected by somebody in this business at some point yeah. so everybody yeah. gets everybody gets rejected and to be able to you know just be able to brush it off yeah i mean what was it like i remember hearing um jk rowling got rejected by like a zillion a billion times and then it was like the edit some random the daughter of the edit something that yeah. found the script and was like so you, you never know. And all of those huge authors have had, have had that story. The most difficult thing about this business is it's a business about, you know, personal, you know, like love for a project and it's so subjective. So you're, you have to get it to somebody and that's exactly what they're looking for at the exact time that it's sent to them. And it's why luck is like 30% of its talent something else and luck I forget yeah like it. perspiration talent no I know what it is it's talent a hundred percent hustle mm -hmm. and, yeah and yeah. you have to have all three you have to be a hustler you have to be talented and you have to just be lucky and I think that's what a lot of writers struggle with because we want to just sit in our cave and write and the hustle part I think is the part that people really struggle with yeah I yeah. hustle every day like constantly constantly hustling and if you don't have that hustle within you with the, which a lot of people don't it might not be the career for you because it's going to be very difficult if you don't have that like drive to constantly hustle because mm -hmm. nobody's going to hustle for yourself more than you will yeah very true well thank you so much Lee. we really thank you really yeah and thank the audience for your great questions. Yeah, and awesome questions. Did we get to, we didn't leave any. We didn't get to them all, but I, th I think they're all, we touched upon a lot of them. And okay, good. You know, good so good. I think we're good. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I will send you all within a few days, the recording. Um, and so watch for that. So thanks again, everybody. Thank Have you. And night. thank you, Jean. Thank you as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.